Hi, everyone. We'll get started in just a few moments here. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started now. Thank you for joining us uh, for this media briefing about COVID-19 in Idaho. My name is Zach Clark and I am moderating today. A reminder that ASL interpretation is available. Search for the window for interpreter stubs and hover over the three little dots to the right in the window to lock it in place. For today's briefing, we'll have remarks from several people to get us started. Health and Welfare, uh, Welfare Director Dave Jepson will begin. And then we'll hear from Public Health Administrator Elke Shah Tulloch, Public Health Medical Director and State Epidemiologist Dr. Christine Hahn, Idaho Bureau of Laboratories Chief Dr. Christopher Ball, and Deputy State Epidemiologist uh, Dr. Catherine Turner before we open it up for questions. Idaho Immunization Program Manager Sarah Leeds is also in attendance today. And with that, I will turn it over to Director Jepson. Well, thank you, Zach, and welcome everyone to this week's um, press briefing on COVID-19. Uh, let's start with some good news. The, the downward trend for the statewide seven-day moving average of cases per 100,000 continued this week. Uh, this is good news. In fact, all Idaho counties have a seven-day moving average of cases per 100,000 below 25. This is the first time that this has happened for many, many months. We have expanded the information on variants of concern being displayed on the dashboard on the, and that's under the laboratory testing page. And on there, you can find the number of confirmed variants and that'll be by the type of variant of concern as well as a map of Idaho with which counties that have confirmed variants of concern. And if you hold your mouse over any county, it will give you specific information for that county. On the testing front, we also had good news that our COVID-19 testing positivity rate dropped to 4.8% last week, which is below our goal of 5%. However, hospitalizations remain higher than we would like, but have stabilized in the last week. The number of long-term care centers with active COVID cases continues to decline and is currently at 54 out of 400 or so facilities. And we're very excited to see that number continue to decline. On the vaccine front, we passed a milestone of over 400,000 Idahoans who are now fully vaccinated. However, last week we saw a decline in the number of total doses administered, which was the first time we've seen that. And we also have about three and a half weeks of inventory in the state, where we like to see just one or two weeks worth of inventory. Uh, it appears that we are rapidly approaching the point where vaccine supply will exceed demand. We anticipated this would happen and Elke will have more information about how we plan to address this. And finally, I wanted to share a brief update on the work taking place to ensure that information is broadly available in Spanish. Reaching those whose first language is Spanish is very important to the vaccination effort. And so all state websites are available in Spanish. And many of the posted documents on the state websites are also available in Spanish, including recommended precautions, counseling services that are available, vaccine cost information, uh, Q&A documents and fact versus fiction documents and multiple videos that we have on our state websites. As you know, we are running a COVID-19 vaccine confidence campaign. In addition to Spanish specific ads on TV and radio, all English ads have Spanish subtitles available. 
All our social media text posts can be converted to Spanish using the social media platform language settings. And finally, the public health districts are undertaking many, many communication and outreach activities that include materials in Spanish and outreach to the Hispanic community. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Elke. Thank you, Director. I appreciate that. Um, as the Director just mentioned, and last week we talked about the observed drop in interest for the COVID vaccines in general, and in addition to the pause in the Johnson Johnson vaccine. And Idaho's administration rate also has dropped to 73.1% compared to the national rate of 80%, and the gap is increasing. And I am going to share my screen with you to show you one slide I'd like to draw your attention to. So on this slide, you can see um, that there was a, a, a slight or significant drop, excuse me, in this slide, we were seeing this increasing trend in our vaccine administration. And then in this last week, we saw this decline right here. Um, after the announcement of on Tuesday of the, the pause on the Johnson Johnson vaccine. We did expect to see some appointments for the Johnson Johnson vaccine to be canceled. So it was not completely surprising to see, see this decline, but the drop in the chart indicates that it was mostly the Johnson Johnson vaccine and a, and a little bit of a drop in the other vaccines as well. We've also heard anecdotally that many scheduled appointments across the state had no shows in addition to canceled clinics. And we're worried that people are becoming increasingly hesitant in a time when we really need to see our vaccination rates increase. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can finish. Um, so to help support our vaccine demand and vaccine confidence, we're engaging in multiple strategies that are really, I put them into two buckets. We're getting the vaccine to people and we're getting people to the vaccine. I have a few examples that we have in the works right now. One of them is we're creating a granting program for enrolled providers to get vaccine into communities through mobile clinics, pop-ups, walk-ins, on-site clinics, home visits, etc. Uh, we know that many providers are already doing these activities, but we would like to see more of this, uh, more of these types of strategies and, and we want to be able to reward that and provide support. We're creating a toolkit of resources for the, some of these clinics to use to make things easy for them. Um, kind of looking at it as almost like a clinic in a box in a way that includes templates for signage, intake forms, educational materials, and things that they need, such as that. We're working with America's Health Insurance Plans, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, to help provide vaccine outreach, scheduling, and potentially transportation. And we're still working that through right now. We're working with the Governor's Economic Rebound Advisory Committee to develop ways to support businesses and their employees in getting vaccine developing education and outreach platforms to reach uh, people who may be vaccine hesitant in both population at both the population and individual level to help answer questions about vaccine safety and effectiveness, how to sign up for vaccines and more. And of course, as the director mentioned, uh, for the Latino population and, and all populations, we're scaling up our messaging campaigns to reach more individuals. And those are just a few of the strategies that we're working towards and working on. We have many more. Um, we're working on both with our public and private um, providers and partners to both stimulate interest in the vaccine as well as make it readily available to anyone who wants one. With that, I believe Dr. Hahn is next up to give her remarks. Thank you, Elke. Um, so I'm just going to give some brief. Um, I'm, I know everybody's been following what's going on with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, but just sort of Idaho perspective um, update. Um, <clears throat> as you were I'll remember a week ago um, we talked about the uh, halt to the Johnson and Johnson vaccine um, that was hoped to be temporary. We don't know yet, um, but we talked about that a little bit last week. And I think at that time we had already sent out a notices to our providers and a press release to the public. Um, so uh, since that time, um, yes, uh, the following day, the 14th, the CDC's advisory committee met to discuss the vaccine. Uh, I was able to um, listen into that entire discussion, uh, very robust discussion. Um, and at the end, the committee really decided that there was not enough information yet to make a decision. And so what they asked for was um, more time. Uh, they didn't vote to hold it longer. They didn't vote to reinstitute it, but they asked for a little more time uh, for CDC to put together a more robust risk benefit analysis. So if there is a, if there is a small but very serious risk associated with a vaccine, 
uh, is, is this a vaccine that it is um, at a population level uh, worth continuing to use or should it be only used in certain populations, that kind of thing. So that will be discussed this Friday. Uh, I look forward to hearing that discussion. Um, the, uh, the, the, some of the challenges for CDC are going to be that this is such a rare condition uh, that not much is known about how common it is. And during the meeting uh, last week, they, they talked a lot about the wide range of possible, you know, it might be as rare as um, 0.5 per 100,000 cases uh, in a population in a year, uh, up to as many as two, um, two people impacted by this uh, as a background rate per 100,000 per year. So that's quite a wide range uh, for, for discussion. So I think CDC is working very hard this week to try to get uh, better information for everybody to make decisions on. So uh, we look forward to Friday and what we're anticipating is either we will hear from them uh, from the committee will vote to either resume use of the vaccine with uh, more information to clinicians about uh, evaluation and diagnosis of and treatment of this rare but serious side effect. Uh, they may recommend to continue, but only for limited groups, for example, in males or in adults, uh, only in certain age groups, for example, based on uh, what has been reported so far. Um, and uh, or they could say just a continued pause that they don't think the risk is worth it in light of the fact that uh, we have Moderna and Pfizer vaccines and possibly other vaccines on the way. So uh, we will, uh, of course, be watching for Friday, in the meanwhile, in Idaho, um, the pause continues. Um, uh, one topic that came up during the meeting is that states uh, do not have to follow the recommendations from the CDC on this matter. The FDA has not withdrawn authorization for the vaccine, uh, but we, and I believe all other states, are uh, paused. Um, in Idaho, one piece of information we've been trying to make sure is out there is that um, Janssen the Janssen vaccine has only been out since March 2nd. So really, uh, if the risk is about one per million, at least that's the initial estimate, uh, we have only administered just shy of 30,000 doses um, in Idaho. So we don't expect to see this very rare side effect here because of the relatively small number of doses that was given. But of course, you never know. It's not a a completely predictable thing. Uh, I want to reassure everyone that we continue to watch this um, and we have not had any reports um, of the of this type of clotting problem. So in summary, um, as I mentioned, we are uh, waiting for um, for Friday's news and information. Uh, as Elke alluded to, we are concerned that we are already seeing a uh, sharp drop off in vaccine uptake. Some of that is certainly due to the fact people were scheduled to get uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine last week, they would not have received that vaccine. Uh, but some of this might be um, uh, a general vaccine hesitancy because people just now are not being sure about the vac any of the vaccines. So uh, we're working really hard to communicate that the other two vaccines have a, the growing safety record. We continue to use those uh, safely and to encourage people to um, uh, consider a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine if possible. And I just want to lastly mention that uh, we continue to uh, watch the medical literature about how beneficial these vaccines are against the emerging variants. Uh, I know Dr. Ball uh, will be talking uh, about the variants in a little bit, but as we know, we have variants in Idaho. Um, we've been encouraged so far by not only laboratory data coming out from the manufacturers where they're looking at the variants in the lab and seeing how antibodies uh, react uh, to those uh, variants and also our first real life study has come out now, our real world study, if you will, from Israel, um, suggesting that the Pfizer vaccine had good protection against the B117, which of course is our most common variant now. So with that, I will uh, leave it at that and I will turn it over to, I believe Dr. Turner is next. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Han. I think it's actually going to be me. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> I gave you such a good lead in too, and then I blew it. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Hey, so uh, welcome everybody and thank you, Director. Um, I'm happy to announce that the Idaho Bureau of Laboratories continues to receive uh, a number of samples, quite a few samples uh, every day for COVID sequencing from all parts of the state. And I wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of those clinical partners that are participating in providing us with the samples that we need to be able to do uh, SARS-CoV-2 surveillance. Um, without their uh, help, we would not be able to uh, get the generate the data that we're that we're currently trying to ramp up quickly. 
Um, that being said, we here at the Idaho Bureau of Laboratories are expecting to get new instrumentation soon that should double our capacity to sequence. We're hoping to have that in place by May. We also are working with some additional partners that are uh, coming online uh, soon. So hopefully as we get into the summer months, we should see a, a marked uptick in the number of samples that we can generate per week. Currently, we're seeing about 100 samples per week being uploaded to public databases, and we're tracking that information multiple times a week just to kind of get a sense of what is happening. As the director mentioned in his opening remarks, we have updated the uh, coronavirus website, and we're put, placing uh, both county-level information about variants uh, and, and which variants are being uh, seen in the state. We're, um, there are a lot of counties that show no variants. That doesn't necessarily mean that we uh, they aren't there. That just means that we haven't either received submissions from them or we haven't identified a variant of concern in those regions. So as you're looking at that data, uh, just uh, be sure, as I've mentioned many times before, that the data that we're seeing is uh, from the Idaho Bureau of Laboratories is heavily biased towards variant detection. Um, there are some great resources to talk about the types of variants that are in general circulation in the United States. The CDC has what they call the National SARS-CoV-2 Strain Surveillance Program, or the NS3 program. And that they publish uh, every two weeks the proportions of strains that are being uh, in general circulation in the United States. And so we can use that as kind of an anchoring point to see how what we're sequencing compares to that random sampling. But again, the data that we're generating is very, very um, biased towards seeing uh, or trying to detect variants in, in the state. That being said, as of this morning, there were 672 samples in public databases from Idaho samples. Uh, we do continue to see two variants of concern increasing in their rates. The, the most abundant strain that we're seeing in the state is that B117 strain, the one that originated in the United Kingdom. And then the second most abundant strain we're seeing is actually a, a series of two lineages, the B.1.427 and 429. Those are the lineages that emerged in California. And those seem to be the two variants of concern that we're seeing uh, increasing in the state. Uh, we have identified uh, two cases uh, associated with the lineage that originated in South Africa, the B.1.351. And thankfully those uh, have not increased. So that one has a little bit more cause concern as it does uh, show some more interesting or um, challenging characteristics associated with those infections. So I think uh, I'll close by saying that we, uh, we update the data on the coronavirus website every Thursday evening. Um, so those numbers will continue to move and change over time. It's a very dynamic data set. So we've just anchored to one point and just those sequences that are available publicly. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Turner and she can give you some more information about the cases associated with those variants we've detected. Thanks, Dr. Ball. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I, yeah, I'm going to provide just some brief updates on Idaho's cases that have been identified as infected with the um, SARS-CoV-2 variants, and we'll also provide you an update on our vaccine breakthrough cases. So as Dr. Ball mentioned the numbers, I'll talk to you a little bit about the people. Um, right now, 98% of the people who we have identified as being infected with one of these variants um, do report being symptomatic. Um, this proportion that um, is reporting symptoms is higher than what we would expect based on um, our data so far. The proportion that we have seen reporting symptoms up until we've started um, sort of you know, searching for these variants, um, we're roughly 80 to 90 percent. So um, it, there, it's a it's a little bit different um, symptom symptomology for those people that we've identified as being infected with one of the variants. Also, five percent of the people known to be infected with one of these variants have been hospitalized, and we have had one death reported. Um, the hospitalization rate is a again we're talking about some small numbers, but that that hospitalization rate is a little bit higher than what we would expect. Um, it's generally um, roughly around three and a half to four percent for our um, overall cases. 
So just, just another reminder that our data are not necessarily generalizable um, because we are targeting samples. But as Dr. Ball mentioned, we do receive sequencing results not only from the Idaho Bureau of Laboratories, but also from some national laboratories um, and working with CDC, uh, who is in turn working with those national laboratories to make sure that the, the sequencing is going on. So that was my update about the variants. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about our vaccine breakthrough cases. As we've mentioned before during other press briefings, uh, vaccine breakthrough cases are expected. Although COVID-19 vaccines are effective and, and they are a critical tool to bring the pandemic under control, there's just no such thing as a vaccine that's 100% effective at preventing all illness. So um, I wanted to update you on the latest data from CDC before I tell you about Idaho. And uh, their data is current as of last Tuesday, April 13th. And uh, it includes data from 43 US states and territories, including Idaho. And those data indicated that at that time, which is a week ago, there were about 5,800 reports of vaccine breakthrough cases um, throughout the United States among about 75 million people in the US that had been fully vaccinated by that time. Um, today in Idaho, we'll be reporting 166 vaccine breakthrough cases. That represents roughly 0.04% uh, of fully vaccinated people in Idaho. Um, and the infections are running the gamut as far as age. Uh, we have um, reported cases from 18 to 100 years old. That's pretty inclusive of all adults. <laughs> um, about a third are in people who are 65 years of age and older. Another third are in people 40 to 64. And the other third are people that are less than 40 years of age. So, um, so uh, pretty well represented, represented as far as the age groups go. Um, however, nearly 90% of our cases are female. Um, so that's a little bit different than um, the national data. Uh, they're skewed a little bit female, but almost nine out of 10 are um, female. 13% of our cases do report an underlying condition. Um, that may have suppressed their immune response to the vaccine, and that's an important piece of information that we collect as part of the investigation of these cases. Um, and just over 40% re report absolutely no symptoms. Uh, the 60% that do have symptoms, uh, nearly all of them, 94% report just mild or moderate um, symptoms ranging from, you know, kind of your cold-like to your flu-like symptoms. And um, I will say that for people, this is roughly 2% of the cases we're aware of have been confirmed to have been hospitalized because of their illness. Each of them were at high risk for severe disease were they to be infected with the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. So it's not surprising that they um, may have been hospitalized. Uh, however, we have um, no reports of death in anyone who um, is, um, has been identified as a, as a vaccine breakthrough case. As far as the vaccines they received go, 54% received the Pfizer vaccine, 39% received Moderna, and 7% received the Janssen vaccine. Finally, of the 13 specimens that were successfully sequenced among these cases, six were identified as a variant of public health concern. Four of them were the B1427 or 429, this is the California variant, and two were the B117 or that, that UK variant. And as Dr. Hahn mentioned, current data do suggest that the um, COVID-19 vaccines currently authorized do offer protection against most of these variants circulating in the country. However, we do um, expect that some of the variants will may cause some of these vaccine breakthrough cases. But just a reminder that current recommendations are that everyone, including those who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, should receive the vaccine unless there's a contraindication to do so. And I'll turn it back over to you, Zach or Elke. All right, thank you, Dr. Turner. We will now take uh, questions from media participants. We will answer as many questions in the time available as we can. Please raise your hand in WebEx by selecting the hand icon in the lower right portion of your screen. You can also type your question into the chat area. Uh, when I say your name, please unmute yourself and announce your name and media outlet before asking your question. And remember to clear your hand when you're done. So the first question I'm seeing will come from Audrey Dutton. Hi, this is Audrey Dutton from the Idaho Capital Sun. Uh, talking about vaccine hesitancy, uh, a lot of the hesitant uh, population seems to be in the wait and see crowd. Um, so not 
not a no, not a yes, but I'm, you know, I'm a little concerned about, you know, the long-term effects and what happens in a year or two. Um, if that's, you know, if that's a fairly large group, how do you anticipate reaching them and um, convincing them that the vaccine is safe? Yeah, thanks, Audrey. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're, I think it's going to take a lot of different um, ways of reaching out and, and being available really to answer those questions. Uh, we need to be able to assure that our that we hear what those those hes hesitancies are, um, that we can address those in any of the media efforts that we're putting forward, whether that's you know television campaigns, our social media posts, addressing them through these press briefings. Um, but I think a, a lot of times it's going to be just a, one of those one-on-one -on -one interactions and conversations that people have with a trusted source. We need to make sure that, that their, their regular source of care is comfortable having those conversations that, you know, if they are, um, you know, have local interactions with, say, local public health or other community-based partners, that they um, have the chance to have conversations with them as well. So I think in terms of reaching who the, the wait and see group is, I think we just need to make sure that we're available and we're getting those messages where they are. We understand what their wait and see concerns are. Um, and that when they're ready, we have vaccine easily available. It's convenient, it's right there. They can walk in when they're ready. Um, and those providers that are giving those vaccines are completely um, uh, ready to have those conversations with them. So I think we're just gonna continue to need to to expand those efforts and push and um, make ourselves available, meaning the providers and public health at large and making the vaccines more readily available. What, but what would you say to them to make them feel more comfortable receiving the vaccine earlier than maybe they're ready to? You know, some people were expecting to not even have their turn until the end of the summer. Right. Um, and now they're making that choice. And and some some folks I've talked to want to wait a year or two to see the data. So mm -hmm. that that seems pretty difficult, even just with having conversations. If somebody is is really waiting um, and set that they want to wait, you know, how do you what message do you give to them? Well, I mean, first and foremost, of course, it's everyone's choice to be able to to, to wait um, until they're comfortable. We want to make sure that people are comfortable. Um, and as Dr. Hahn mentioned, and I neglected to add into my comments, um, you know, we are seeing a, a, a growing um, a safety record of both Pfizer and Moderna, and seeing you know millions and millions of doses being administered across the U.S. and uh, like I said, like that growing safety record and efficacy as they are uh, rolled out over time. So now I'll, I'll ask if Dr. Hahn has anything that she wants to add to that as well. Yeah, um, Audrey, you ask a really great question that, of course, we're asking ourselves. And um, I, I think a couple things. Some people um, will find it really reassuring that um, it, we think about the, the big vaccination effort in this country that started in December with healthcare workers and long-term care, but really... There are folks that were participating in the clinical trials that have now, they're coming close to a year now out. So we do have a cohort of people that, um, you know, we keep getting updates on from the, um, through the medical literature about how they're doing, how their immunity is lasting. And I guess, um, as Elke mentioned, there are some people that if they're going to want to wait two years and, and nothing short, shy of that's going to help. Um, the only other thing I think that is helpful to point out is we really don't know the long-term effects of COVID yet, but what we do know from medium, short-term and medium-term is pretty, um, you know, dire. Um, there are some, of course, very uh, severe risks uh, at the time of the illness, but we hear so much about folks with the long haul and symptoms and so forth. And just to remind them that uh, that's not one of those you just get over, you know, get it, get it like the flu or the a cold and then you're done. Uh, we do know we're learning more and more about people who have long term complications from that infection and to consider that as well. But it's it's not an easy conversation, but I think that's the other thing we can try to do to balance the perception of risk. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Angelica Levito. Great, thank you. Um, this is Angelica Levito calling from Bloomberg News. 
Um, do you think that Idaho has reached the peak of its vaccination campaign, and what will you do if providers aren't able to use their supply? How will you monitor it, and what will you do if you see that they're not using their shots? Um, that's another great question. And, and regarding the peak, I think we we hope to continue to see an increase uptake of vaccine across the state. We want to make sure we, we make every effort, but in terms of probably the, the speed at which we're going to reach any kind of peak is um, we've probably achieved that already. Um, but of course, we want to make sure that, uh, like I said, we, we are making that vaccine available for people where they are. So it is probably going to slow down. You know, of course, as we, we go to different types of tactics, it's going to be you know, smaller clinics that are held, it's going to be 20 doses here and 15 here and 600 over here, as opposed to maybe thousands at a, at a time that we're getting vaccinated. Um, but, we, we're, but we're not going to give up. We're going to continue to push forward and make sure that we have the vaccine available to anyone who wants it. Um, and now I'm, that I've talked so long, I forgot the second half of your question. So if you don't like repeating No worries. Over. The second <laughs> half was um, how will you monitor okay, thank you. whether um, providers are using their vaccine supply and what will you do if they're not? Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry about that. I'm going to let Sarah, of course, answer that question as the vaccine um, program manager because we do have very robust um, monitoring of that. So, Sarah? Yeah, thanks, Alfie. Um, so right now we monitor that through IRS and 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 our our inventory tracking systems that we have with CDC and um, and of course you can see that on the provider transparency page. Um, so for now that those two tools are the way both we as a program and the department and also the public can um, look at that at any given point in time. If um, if that provider transparency page um, isn't, you know, if, if, if the governor decides that's not necessary anymore, um, we still as a program monitor um, inventory on a regular basis. We do that all the time with our routine pediatric vaccine. And so um, this, the part of your question about how, what we will do about it, I think that that depends on um, our leadership and how we choose to approach providers. The one thing we do know that as we move into um, you know, the kind of the longer term work of vaccinating uh, for, against COVID, we want to make sure that every provider has some inventory in their offices so that people, there's no missed opportunity for getting a vaccine. So if I happen to go into a provider's office for um, a wellness check um, and I haven't had my COVID vaccine, they can say, how about, how about your COVID vaccine? And I can agree and get that vaccine as opposed to them not having the inventory there, and then there's a missed opportunity. Um, and then I might have to go back and I may be less likely. So, so it's gonna be a balance and some of those decisions at the leadership level haven't been made yet, but we have the mechanisms in place to monitor the inventory. Okay, next question uh, will be from Kyle Fonensteel. Thanks. Uh, this is Kyle Fonan, still with the Post Register. Um, I, I I wanted to ask uh, a little bit more about Angela's topic about monitoring vaccine inventory. Uh, the governor's executive order a few months ago said that providers should use all vaccines within a week of receiving them. Uh, at the time, you said that vaccine providers were doing that, were meeting that request. Uh, what's time like now? How long are vaccines sitting in freezers at suppliers or at providers? Yeah, thanks, Kyle. We are monitoring that very closely, and I'm going to ask Sarah if she wants to to talk about that as well. Uh, sure. Thanks, Elke. Um, one of the things we are starting to see is um, providers being hesitant to take on additional doses that are available to them. Um, now that we've seen um, steady, we've had increases in supply, and then right now it's been um, steady with Pfizer and Moderna um, is available to order. And we're seeing a little bit of hesitancy in in taking on more because they they don't want to they don't want to violate that um, governor's executive order. And so there is some inventory on hand right now, like the director said in his opening statement. We've got um, a couple weeks of inventory in the state. Um, did I miss a second? 
No, uh, thank you. And, and a quick follow up, if I could ask, I'm not sure who this might be uh, best geared toward, but uh, your, your uh, the, the state's survey on vaccine attitudes in late January found that uh, that vaccine hesitancy was most concentrated in Republican voters. Republican voters were pretty evenly split on whether they'd take the vaccine uh, generally and pretty uh, pretty evenly split on whether they would not take the vaccine ever. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what's, how are you factoring in political ideology and party ID into your vaccine outreach? Yeah, um, Director, do you want to take that one? I'm sure. Uh, great question, Kyle. Um, you know, obviously, the, there's both national data and the, and the data we looked at at the state that do um, reveal a correlation uh, between um, uh, conservative versus liberal views and, uh, and a view towards the vaccine. And so that's been out, I think, for quite a while. From our perspective, um, we're not, when we message and engage around the vaccine, we really don't talk about it in terms of political ideology. Uh, we really have couched that in the terms of the facts, and you can see that in our advertising campaign that's on the air right now. Uh, and really try to, especially if it's all the way down to that conversation in the doctor's office or the pharmacist at the pharmacist at the pharmacy, excuse me, uh, is really to couch that in the conversation for that person, uh, and really in the context of their medical situation and and their concerns that they may have for the vaccine. Uh, and to, to speak to that. So we really take a much more fact-based approach. Uh, and also a key part of our message, uh, and you can see it again in the advertising that we're running but came out of our research, um, is to really emphasize the point that uh, the vaccine is the quickest way we have. I think our, our tagline there is it's the best shot we have of getting Idaho back to normal. Uh, and I, I think regardless of political ideology, uh, all of us, including all of us on this call, uh, would like to see life go back to a non-pandemic state. Uh, and so that's some of the key messages that we found work regardless of political ideology. And that's where we've really captured our messages is uh, around the facts of the safety that exist. And you heard Dr. Han talk about that earlier. Uh, and then the second is, is uh, this is really our best tool we have to have our kids in, in class in the fall, which I think all of us want our kids in class in the fall. Uh, to make sure we preserve jobs and we uh, get life to back to back to normal. Uh, and so those are the messages we, we've really um, focused on as we've um, addressed that population. Thank you. Okay, next up is Melissa Davlin. Hi, Melissa Davlin with Idaho Public Television. I had a quick question about those breakthrough cases and I understand that it's still early and we're still learning so much more about these, but I'm especially interested in the nearly 90% of breakthrough cases being women. Does that line up with national data? And is that um, pretty general across all of those other age demographics and um, everything else you were looking at too? Ask Dr. Turner. Hi, right, thanks, Melissa. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, as you probably are well aware um, in the healthcare sector, um, it, is, it does have a tendency to skew a little bit female. So we're assuming that that first round of vaccine recipients in Idaho um, that were um, frontline healthcare workers were probably um, skewed a little bit female too. So it is um, highly likely that um, these, these fully vaccinated people who are, you know, six weeks out from their very first dose um, may be that first round of people that receive the vaccine. What I can tell you, um, CDC has not publicized their um, vaccine breakthrough data, unfortunately. Um, and I was just scrolling through what I know. And I do know that um, I don't have any, um, I don't have any data from CDC on um, by sex, so I can't tell you what Idaho is compared to to the to the U.S. However, I do know they're going to try to get those data published somewhere. They do have a vaccine breakthrough page, but there's no data available yet. And this was just data they released through a um, kind of a press release. Um, and I don't remember the second part of your question, Melissa. Can you can you repeat it? Yeah. yeah. Does that 90% is that even across the board as in all of those other age demographics and and other factors that you might be tracking with those breakthrough cases yeah so uh yes uh they do the 
the females are tracking about the same as through the age classifications as the as the entire um, sample or the entire group of people who have um, been reported with a vaccine breakthrough case, mostly because they're a majority of it. So um, yeah, they are they are the same proportions by age. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, and that appears to be our final question for the day. Um, oh, we a question just came in the chat, um, and this is from Elaine Williams. Uh, her question, um, what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated to have herd immunity and what percentage is Idaho at now? I'm going to ask Dr. Hahn, who is becoming a professional at addressing this question, so. <laughs> Yeah, um, herd immunity is something you'll hear about and we hear discussed and debated a lot at the national level. The challenge is that right now, um, nobody knows exactly what percent of the population needs to be immune um, in order to achieve kind of a full herd immunity um, of a population. Um, estimates right now are around 80%. Sometimes you'll hear 85%. Um, sometimes you'll hear a little bit lower, um, like 75%. So it's kind of probably somewhere around there. Um, we know for other diseases, uh, they can be higher, like measles is kind of the classic very high herd immunity uh, level of about 90% or above in order to prevent measles outbreaks. So we know that uh, it's not unusual to have very high level of immunity required to stop outbreaks. Um, that said, um, even though we know we're not there with Idaho yet, I think the director gave some some numbers on kind of where we're at as far as our vaccination rates. We also know we have some protection in the population from people who may have had uh, COVID and have some natural immunity. As a reminder, we do recommend people that have had COVID that they still should uh, talk with their healthcare provider or get you know about getting vaccinated or if they're comfortable get vaccinated because. Uh, little is known about the quality of that immunity um, and how long it will last, how broad it is, whether it would protect them against a variant and that type of thing. Um, so the recommendation is if you've had COVID to still go ahead and we do recommend immunization. Nonetheless, we know that there's some level of protection in the population from people who've had COVID before, at least for a, a duration of time. So we know we're not there yet. We don't know exactly what it's going to be for working purposes. We are using somewhere around 80%, but we know that that might change as more uh, as new variants come in, as more is known. Um, and we know that we've got a ways to go to get there. Um, you know, our, our highest vaccinated group right now, our seniors, 65 and older, you know, we we're happy to see over 70% in that population, but uh, we, do, we do have ways to go to get our population to where we feel like we need to be. Okay, and that was our last question, so we will wrap it up for today. Uh, we are planning another media briefing next week at 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, that's Tuesday, April 27th. Watch for those details on Monday, and thank you all for joining us today.